It is a joy to be with you all on the Lord's Day. It always is. Um, just a quick reminder, just in case you weren't here last week and we are bringing you up to speed, um, we are praying intentionally uh, for our leaders um, each Sunday now, our elected officials, and we're also going to be praying for other area churches. And we're going to do it right before the sermon each and every week. And this week we're going to be praying for Hope Presbyterian Church, which is right down the road, and we're going to be praying for Mayor Julius Alcindor. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1-4 through 4 says this, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for all kings, and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Now, we don't have kings necessarily anymore, but we do have elected officials, so the principle still applies. We want to pray for them. So, we're going to pray for Mayor Alcindor now in the mayoral office, and we're going to ask God's blessings and that he would be working his will through them accordingly. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Our Lord and King, Lord of lords and King of all kings, we thank you that your word tells us that you appoint rulers as your ministers, that they are placed by you according to your will for the purpose of keeping evil at bay. We ask that they would be resolved purpose of our mayor's office, that that would be the resolved purpose of our mayor's office. That Mayor Alcindor would be emboldened by you and convicted by your Holy Spirit to pursue your truth and your word above all else, and that he would live by it, delight in it, and be held fast to it all of his days. We pray for him as he attempts to administrate our city. The work is looming at times, and we ask that you would give him strength and resolve to face it well. And that he would know that it is from your hand that this strength comes. And it would be a gospel witness unto his life. That if he does not believe on you, that he would repent and believe. That he would have focus. And that you would supernaturally guide him to the next right thing before him. That he would not be distracted by the many things that may demand his attention. But that you would lead him in great strides of progress in his work for the betterment of this city. Father, we pray... That, he may, that if he may have any secret sin in his life, that you would free him of it. Convict him by your spirit, place your hand upon him, that he may receive the joyful grace of confession and repentance. And if he have no church, that you would send him one by your grace and power. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. We're also going to take a moment now to pray for our brothers and sisters down the street at Hope Presbyterian Church. Uh, they are also in search of a pastor at this time. And so we're going to pray for them in that and just in general. Ephesians chapter 6 instructs us to do this, instructs us to pray for the saints. And so we lift up our prayers for other churches with us in our area and around us as we fight to build the kingdom of Christ together. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray for the saints at Hope Pres? Father, we come to you on behalf of our brothers and sisters at Hope Presbyterian Church as they are seeking a new pastor. We pray for your grace and favor in this search and that you would send them one strong for the task, prepared and well-versed in both the pastoral and the teaching ministry, one that can lead them well. We pray for unity of their leadership, that their elders may be of one accord, and if there be any disharmony or sin amongst them, that you would not allow it to remain, that it would be revealed, confessed, and removed for your glory and the strength of your church. We pray for those saints that they would grow in their faith and their love for you and other saints. That you would encourage them and build them up in the fear and admonition of you. We thank you for the generations of witness that this church has already provided to our city. And we pray that their lampstand would burn all the brighter for the generations to come. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you please stand for the reading of God's Word this morning? Psalm 23. Verses 1 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house 
of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for your word. We pray now that you would instruct us clearly by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we would repent and believe and submit to you in all things, and that if we have any secret sin hidden under anything in our hearts, that you would reveal it and drive it out from us by the power of your Holy Spirit. May you convict us with a strong hand, and we pray that you would not let us go until we are holy in submission to you. You are good, and your mercies endure forever. We thank you for these mercies, and we pray for them now as we receive your word with joy. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. So, so far, as we, well, I stuck to the floor there for a second. I don't know if you saw that, but I thought I was going to fall over. So far, they have freshly painted these floors, and so there's a bit of a danger. Uh, we've been talking about Jesus as a shepherd up to this point, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. There's been this perpetual illustration of the, of the Lord as shepherd, his, his rod and his staff, right? And those were the tools of the shepherd. The rod was there to, to correct us. The staff was there to drag us back against our well. The, the rod was also utilized sometimes as like a billy club to beat the, beat the lions and the wolves and the, the threats to the sheep away. And it's, it's kindness that we see again and again. But now in verse five, which is what we're picking up today, you're going to notice a little bit of a shift, okay? We're moving away from the illustration of a shepherd and into a, a new type of imagery. Okay, so you got to pay close attention because that shift is, is really subtle. In fact, it just kind of assumes it. If you look at verse 5, it starts off, it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cups overflow. So what we're seeing now is this picture from shepherd to host, right? You know, we're, we're seeing a shift. And I think a more appropriate way to say that, other than, other than just host, is we're going, moving from shepherd to, to Lord, almost. So we're going to work through, starting at verse 5, we're just going to kind of walk through this carefully together. And as we go, I want you to have that image in your mind. Now, you might say, um, what on earth are you talking about a Lord? And Probably the best pictures for you to have in the front of your brain when we're dealing with terminology like that is, is to think of the feudal lords of, of Britain in the Middle Ages. Uh, I, I, and a, maybe a better way to describe Britain in the Middle of the Ages, in the Middle Ages, would be um, Christendom 1.0. Do you all know what I mean, I mean whenever I say that? I mean, the, the laws of Christ were ruling and reigning by and large. Um, we get the spin version of that story, and we often hear it's the Dark Ages. But if you go through and if you really read the historians around that particular season of time, there was a lot of great things going on as a result of Christianity. There was a lot of people abusing it too, and there were bad things as well. But I would encourage you, in fact, there's a new book that just released by Ben Merkel. It's about Alfred the Great. Um, you can go find it, read it through, or listen to it if you like audiobooks. I would encourage you to pick that up because that's going to give you a snapshot into some of these really profound Christian civilizations, few, uh, feudal lords that existed inside of Britain. It's, it's a very amazing story to tell. But you, I want you to picture that now. As we're moving from verse 5, picture more of like a, a lord, like a king in a castle, like, um, I don't know, King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, you know, if you need to picture it that way, just so you can kind of get these things moving forward. But look at verse 5. Look at what the Lord does, the, the host does, first out of the jump. You prepare a table before me. Now, when we, when we talk about a table, what are we really talking about? We're, we're talking about a, an invitation to, to what? What's the table for? Somebody's coming to dinner, right? Somebody's coming over to your house. So you're, you're, about to, you're about to entertain. So you prepare a table before me. What we're really getting after is the idea of, of hospitality. Now, hospitality, the, the idea of, of being welcoming to someone, being generous with someone, is actually a, a qualifier for a lot of things in the scriptures. For one thing, if you, if you look at, the, at the, uh, the requirements to be on the widow's rolls, look at, listen to this. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works, if she has brought up children and has shown hospitality. The, the requirements for the biblical model of welfare that we find in the New Testament, one of the requirements for those widows is, has she been a generous woman? Isn't that amazing? That's a high moral standard. To be generous. And not just that, one of the qualifications for elders, you remember the qualifications for elders? There's lots of them. They, a husband of one wife, um, they must be apt to teach, they must be self disciplined, and if you read them closely, they have to be hospitable. They, they have to be welcoming. Now, let's take a moment here and just think about this. 
The Bible gives an, a tremendous moral authority to those who practice the godly gift of hospitality. And here we see in Psalm 23, the Lord, our Lord, King Jesus, our shepherd, also demonstrating that same quality, that same quality of hospitality. So I think it matters. Now, if we, if we think for just a moment, let's just reflect on, on the Great Commission. What, is, what does the Great Commission say? Go and make disciples, right? But here's the thing. Whenever that's all we have, we make the mistake of thinking that going and make disciples, going and making disciples is just teaching Bible studies, is just teaching Sunday school classes, is maybe sharing the gospel with somebody over a cup of coffee. And what, what we're really doing in, this, in a list like that is we're just describing, um, you know, what pastors do, <laughs> right? And there's far more to it than that. Here's the deal. If you want to accomplish the Great Commission in your house, if you want to go and make disciples, teaching them to, to follow all of Christ in all of life, submit to all of Jesus, then the vehicle, okay, are you listening? The vehicle for that is the hospitality of your home. Did you hear me? If you want to proclaim the gospel to the world that they may repent and believe and follow Jesus, the vehicle for that is hospitality. When you set a table for others, in other words, the same way that Jesus does here in Psalm 23. And this is, okay, you know what? If you got your phones or your Bibles, flip to Acts 16 real quick, because this is going to be important. And thumb, you know, put your thumb on it, highlight it, you know, whatever. Acts chapter 16, we're going to start in verse 29. Because here's the deal, okay? It's also hospitality. So hospitality is, is a high moral standard. It's a requirement for elders and pastors. It's a requirement to receive supplemental support from the church for widows. And, and here we also see that it is a vehicle for the Great Commission. And not only that, but it's also something that God's people just do, okay? Look at verse six, uh, Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 29. We'll read through it together. Y'all follow along. I'm going to point out a couple of things to you as we go. Starting in verse 29, and the jailer called for lights and rushed in. Y'all remember what the context is here, right? And trembling, he fell down before Paul and Silas because he thought what was going to happen. He thought they were going to run away, and then he was going to get executed because his life would be forfeit for the prisoners. That's the context here, right? He, he trembled and he fell down before Paul and Silas because they were still there. Verse 30, then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And then watch what happened. So, so he, okay, got it. What do I got to do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved in all your household. And he says, okay, <laughs> got it. And then what does he do immediately following? Look at verse 33. Pay close attention. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once. Why? Because his fruit of hospitality was an evidence of his saving faith. And then... He was baptized at once, he and all his family. Verse 34, then he brought them up into his house and did what? He set food before them. You see that? Home dude just got saved. And the evidence of his salvation is how generous he's being with his former prisoners. You see? He set food before them and he rejoiced along with his entire household, that he had believed in God. What flows naturally from the jailer is hospitality. He's filled with joy. His cup overflows. You see, that's what that verse is talking about. His cup is overflowing. He's been changed. He's been transformed by the God of the gospel. He's been transformed by the truth of God. And he says, I've got to share this with people. Y'all are coming to dinner. That's it, right? I have to tell, come on, you're coming to my house. I mean, technically, y'all are still my prisoners, so get, you know, we're going. And he loads, puts them in the house and eat this food. Like, well, I'm sure he was nicer than that, but you get my point. He was, he was immediately so moved. 
His Christianity wasn't just inside of him, in other words. His faith, now this is important, his faith was not some personal, secret, internal faith. It came out of his hands. Do you see? And it came out of his hands in the form of what? Hospitality. In the form of num-nums. In the form of generosity. Do you get it? He was caring for them immediately. Now, I do want to insert some qualifiers here because I think sometimes we confuse uh, the idea of hospitality with the idea of fellowship. And hospitality does include fellowship. Fellowship is inside of hospitality, but just because you're having fellowship doesn't mean you're being hospitable. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain this a little bit, okay? Just because you're having fellowship with somebody, just because you're hanging out with somebody, okay, does not mean that you are being hospitable to that person. There's a, there's a difference. Just because you have hangout time is not meaning necessarily that you're, you're effectively operating in hospitality because what is consistently happening as we see both Jesus and the, the guard who was just saved exhibit hospitality, what do they do? They immediately do what? They feed you, Right? Not, it's not just, and now we spend time together and we have fellowship and we have, we have community with one another. It's not just that. They're, they're generous, in other words. It is a lot of work to have people to your house. Amen? Especially when you got little kids. Because, like, what's the thing on the front of your brain when you have little kids? The house is never... There it is. You see, it's never clean. And there's always, right? I wish we could have people over, but the, you know, house isn't clean. Oh, man. Oh, well, one day we'll be more like Jesus. (laughs) No, we're called to do it now. That's what makes hospitality generous. Do you see what I'm saying? It makes hospitality generous because you are saying, I am giving of myself to get the poop off the walls of the house long enough, if you got itty bitty kids, you know it's true. You know it's true. We're we gonna pretend we're too high for this. You know this is real. I'm gonna clean. I'm gonna clean the house. I'm gonna fix that electrical socket that might kill somebody. I'm gonna. I'm gonna take care of it because you all got one in your house. You know that, right? Like every, some of y'all are like, we got that electrical socket that might kill you. No, all us do. We all got it. Every single one of us. I'm going to take care of it, and I'm going to be generous with what I have towards someone else. It's not just hangout time, okay? It's not just fellowship. It's generosity oriented towards the other. You in, invite people to your home, Right? You take out the good plates. Some of us bought good plates that never get used. Don't do that. <laughs> you got good plates? Take out the good plates. Be, be generous with your time. Be generous with your possessions. I don't know, pastor, they've got little kids. That's what generosity means. It means you're okay if the two-year-old breaks the china. I mean, I'm not saying to hand the two-year-old the $1,400 crystal goblet because that would be dumb, okay? But I do think it's a good idea for us to be oriented towards generosity. You make the good food. Well, I got a lot of people coming over, so uh, I'm making soup. The cheap soup. You know what I'm talking about? And we're making four pots of rice, but the same portion of meat we always make because I got people coming over. See, that's not, that's not generous, that's not generous. What's generosity? What's hospitality? I got people coming over, so thaw the steaks out. Ugh, right? All right, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're all having meat, and they're eating a lot of it, and the budget is ruined. You know, like, amen. Amen. That's what generosity is. If you're generous with your time and your wealth, you are practicing hospitality the right way. It's not just spending time together. It's not. It's not just fellowship. It's not. Fellowship is important, but not all fellowship is hospitality. And if you're not being generous with your wealth and time, you're missing 
a very important fruit of the gospel. That is a qualification for widows to receive support. That is a qualification for elder and pastor. That is a high moral standard set by the Bible. If you're not being generous with what you have, you're missing an important fruit of the gospel. I'll also say this. Hospitality, real biblical hospitality, is a skill, okay? Which means you got to start somewhere and then keep building. Do you get what I'm saying? And we, we are a church that believes in the holy trajectory. Amen? You got to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. Jesus comes and he finds us exactly where we are, right? He finds us exactly where we are, but then he does what? Go this way. Oh, but I don't want to. Go that way. Yes, sir. I will go that way. Um, I, I, uh, I'm doing a, a health and fitness thing right now, and there's this thing called Bulgarian split squats. Have you ever heard of these before? Yeah, no, just, okay. A Bulgarian split squat is also known as the devil, all right? Okay? It is the most painful exercise I have ever done in my entire life. It's, it is the devil. I'm not joking. And, and you know why I'm doing one? You know why I'm doing these stupid things? So I can hold my grandchildren. And so, oh, isn't that cute? <laughs> yeah, I hate that. I never want to do them again. But it's worth it. Do you see? There's a, there's a painful bodily <laughs> sacrifice. There's a stretch that I have to do that one day is going to help me to live longer and my hips won't go out sooner and my knees will last longer so that I can keep picking my grandkids up off the floor. That's my goal. That's what I want. I want to be that 85-year-old, absurdly strong papa. Do you have one of those growing up? They're like 85 years old and you're like, I'm pretty sure he could pull that tree out of the ground if he wanted to. I don't know how he does that. That's my, that's my goal with my children. Now, hospitality works the same way. You start somewhere and you stretch, and you work out, and you go, and eventually over time, you have some longevity and some experience, and you can handle more responsibility. You get stronger, in other words. Are y'all following with me here? So maybe the first time that you try hospitality, you invite people over to your house, and you made some good food, and you only burned one thing, and it's off a paper plate. Hot dog, we started. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And then, and then the next time, maybe you burned less right? And then the time after that, maybe you're like, we're washing the dishes after everybody leaves. Hot dog, you know? And then maybe the time, you see what I'm saying? You stretch and you grow and you, you learn how to do it over time. But if you don't practice and hone that skill, you lose it. Do you hear me? And eventually you get isolated into your own little personal social bubble where you say, oh, I'm just too tired to spend any time with anybody. Oh, I just want to, and then what happens? You get depressed, you get isolated, and the devil uses that to creep sin into your life, doesn't he? 100%, every time. The Lord would call us to live a life of hospitality and to think of it like a workout, to stretch. So what does, it got, what does all this mean? All right, so for God's people who are serious about practicing hospitality, who really want to do it, this affects every facet of your life. It affects the kind of houses that you buy, why? Because you want to make sure you got enough space, right? We really want, I, I know, I have, I have a friend who built a house, I'm not kidding, with the design of hospitality in mind. He has this one huge room. I mean, it's huge, okay? It's probably near the size of just the floor here of the Delta Grand. That's boom, one room. And then off of that room, there's a few bedrooms and a few bathrooms, but there's this one massive room, no hallways, why did he do that? Because he wanted to be hospitable. Because he wanted to have a bunch of people be able to fit inside of his house at the same time so that he could practice this skill of hospitality. It matters what kind of home you have if you want to be hospitable. It also matters, do you have a spare bedroom? Right? Do you, do you have a spare bedroom? Do you have a, I don't know, a mother-in-law out back? Do you, have, do you have an apartment? Do you have a basement? No, none of us have those because we live in Louisiana. So skip that analogy. Maybe a tiny house. Maybe some kind of shed that you convert into a place with a mattress in it. I don't know. 
But if we want to be an outpost for the gospel, let's just speak totally practically for two minutes, okay? Less than that, 10 seconds. Let's just speak very practically for 10 seconds. If we, as Christ Church Opelousas, want to be an outpost for the gospel here in our area, we have to get this right. And I got to tell you, every time I've sent somebody to stay in a hotel here in Opelousas, they've just about every time had a bad experience. And some of y'all are like, oh yeah, so it's not just us. I know. Which means until we get some savvy business owners in this room who own hotels and run them properly and do what we ought to do, we got to become good at this. And we need to have that type of mindset. If we want to be an outpost for the gospel, if we want people to come here and experience Jesus and learn more about who he is, we have to start by being generous with the spaces inside of our homes. We have to start with the simple thing like, do I have a guest bedroom? Do I have a mother-in-law? Do I have an apartment that I could rent? Do I have a tiny house? Do I have space where I can provide an avenue for someone to come and learn and be a part of Jesus' people, and then move out. This isn't new. I mean, this is what all the early monasteries were. They were outposts of generosity. Go, go do some reading on the, on the early Irish monasteries. They're phenomenal places. All the, you want to know, <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, I don't have all the time to get into this, but just go do some fun reading on it, because it, criminals went there to run from the law, and they left saved as followers of Jesus. It's awesome. And that could be us. I'm not saying let the criminal stay in your spare bedroom. Not what I'm saying. Moving on to the next thing. What about your budgets? When you set your budgets, don't spin to the wall, right? You leave a margin so that you can, so that you can buy some good meat, right? So that, so that you, can, so you can get the good china, so that, so that you can be generous oriented towards other people. When you run your schedules, don't just run your schedule to the wall every day. Put some margin. Put some space. Put some time for you to be able to be generous with other people. Pastor Stewart, you don't understand. I have no time at all. I got it. But start somewhere. Start somewhere and stretch. And watch what the Lord does with that time. But let me caution you about this. Let me caution you real fast. If are y'all listening? Yeah, there are babies here. You're going to be fine. Just listen, okay? If your house is out of order, okay? If, if your kids are wild and unrestrained, if, you're, if there is discord in your marriage, if you don't have, think you have the discipline to clean the floors and get the pile of dirty dishes out of the sink that you've left there to soak, y'all you know what I'm talking about? Soak. Okay. If the bathroom is just a perpetual nuclear disaster zone, if there's always little quips and infighting in your home, do not bring a guest into that. Why? Because that's not hospitable. And that's not going to be a picture of the gospel to them. Do you see? Did you hear what I just... This is very important. If your house is out of order, you've got to take care of that first. You see? There might be some confession and some repentance that you need to deal with. There might be some sins that you've got to get, get out, get confessed thoroughly and done. But, but don't bring a guest into that. Don't bring a guest into, into your home whenever your kids are just in utter and complete total rebellion to you and to the Lord. It's not going to be helpful for them. Don't, don't bring a guest into your home when all your... Have you ever seen that episode of The Office where, where Michael and his girlfriend are just fighting the whole time and they've got guests over their house? Some of y'all are like, we don't watch those pagan shows. Okay, fine, I got it. But some of us do. And that's the whole point of it. Is every, the whole room is full of uncomfortable people because all they do is fight. See, this is, goes back to the same thing that we talk about over and over and over again. It's concentric circles. Do you remember? You confess and repent of your sins first. Take the log out of what? Your eye. And then deal with the person who has the speck in theirs. Confess and deal with your sins first. And then over those that you have influence, you lead to do the same. And it flows outward from there. The testing ground of you being hospitable to those outside of your home 
is first, are you hospitable to those inside of it? Do you see? Is your marriage in good shape? I'm not saying perfect. I'm not saying we all got it figured out. I'm saying, have you confessed all your sins to your spouse, gotten it clean, and then lived in the joy of the Lord for a season of time, just a couple of months even? Then, then, bring them in. Bring them in. Are are your kids in total and complete rebellion? Get your kids in submission to the authority of God first. You don't want to invite somebody over and the kids just keep coming over and kicking them in the shin the whole time. That's not fun for anybody. Get them, get their sins dealt with. Then invite people in from there. Hospitality starts first with the people that live with you. Be generous with them. Overflowing love oriented to them. Be kind to them. Then when your household is shored up, not if your household is shored up, but when it is, then be generous to others. You see, it's those concentric circles. You start here with yourself. You leap out to your family and you leap out to the world around you. That's how it works. That's how it always was intended to work. The gospel flows out and it flows out best of healthy churches and healthy homes, which is why we talk about repenting of our own sin all the time at this church. Y'all are probably tired of hearing that dead horse. Well, we're just going to keep it going forever, so get used to it. Now, I prepare a table. He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Now, let's, let's look at some more passages here. Let's look cl- carefully at the table. Uh, so first, it, it says, he anoints my head with what? Now, that's weird, right? Like, we're all sitting here like, he pours olive oil? Oh, that's nasty. I just took a shower. Like, I don't want, ugh, I don't want greasy. But see, we, we are missing something. This is, a better way to understand this would be as the oil of gladness, okay? Um, and, and a proper understanding would be, um, do you remember the, the, uh, the prostitute who came into Jesus and she broke open the alabaster jar that was full of nard and she poured it all over his feet and his head. Do you remember that? And we're going to talk about that more in depth in a little bit, but that was, that's the oil, okay? It's a very expensive perfume. And the, and the design, here's the deal, okay? Back in Jesus's day, when they're all walking on the street, what do they share the streets with? Animals. What are they stepping in all day? Yeah, that. Okay, we got it. What do they smell like? Okay, you understand? This is also why it's so significant that, there, that Jesus demonstrated to his disciples the task of washing feet because what is he washing off of everybody else's feet? Yeah, that. Okay, you, you got it? People didn't smell good in this particular time in history. They did not. They did not have daily showers. They did not have soap. They did not have plumbing. And they definitely didn't have deodorant yet. Okay? Now, you imagine getting 40 of your best friends inside of a relatively confined space within 20 feet of each other after they've been working all day. How does that smell? Bad. Okay? The point of the oil of gladness, the point of the, of the, of the prostitute's oil of the nard, the point of all of this was to give everybody a little bit of fresh and relief from what was going on in the world around them. See? To cover, to cover the smell, but also to, to make them feel refreshed again. It's the way that we would understand this best together, whenever you're with other believers and you're just jiving with them, mm, wrong word, mm, I don't know, that's all the word I got, jiving, we're going with jiving, but here we are. You're spending time with them, the fellowship is sweet, and it's almost like there's a moment of heaven in your house. You know what I'm talking about? The fellowship is sweet and the Lord lifts the burdens of the world from you. And you think, this is what eternity must be like. This is it. See, that oil that, they're, that he's talking about, the oil of gladness, is, is ultimately, it's a picture of the Holy Spirit doing that in the times that we gather with God's people. He anoints my head with oil. He anoints us with the Holy Spirit so that the joy of our salvation runs throughout that's the purpose here. It's the spirit that the Lord pours on us to refresh us as we work and labor in, in the shadow of death, as the psalm said earlier, right? So there's the oil. But let's talk about the cup. Hey, what's in the cup? Y'all are nervous now, aren't you? You don't want to say it. That's okay. What's in the cup? Just say it out loud. Come on, this is a safe place. Say it nice and loud. What's in the cup? 
<laughs> Y'all sure it ain't water? It's not. What about grape juice? It's not grape juice? No, because grape juice didn't show up until the early 1900s. You didn't know that, did you? It's true. You can thank Mr. Welch for that. I'm not making that up. I'll give that history lesson another time. Listen, it's wine. It's wine. Now, I just want to run through some things real fast with you. Just, you know, blip, 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 real quick so that we can understand this. If you want to go look at Ecclesiastes chapter 10, you'll see that there's some very specific statements that tell us that wine actually makes your life gladder. Amen. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's Bible, okay? It says, wine gladdens life. Now, the abuse of wine does not gladden life. It makes life terrible. But wine is a good gift from God that God has subscribed to us to be used properly. And if we use it properly, it gladdens life. In fact, if you look at Judges chapter 9, there's a grapevine talking. I'm not, I'm not making that up. Judges chapter 9, there's a grapevine that talks. And it says, Should I stop giving my wine that cheers both God and man to hold sway over the trees? See, wine makes happy. And it doesn't just make man happy, it also makes who happy? Just said it. They make God and man. God gives us good gifts. Psalm 104 says, wine gladdens the heart of man. Oil makes his face to shine and bread sustains his heart. Isn't that awesome? There's this beautiful picture. My cup overflows. The oil anointed to our head, our, cup, our cups overflow. It gives joy. It gives merriment. It gives relief from the life that we live in the shadow of death. God gave us the good gift of wine. And we should trust Him with it. It's not water. It's not water. It's wine. And it overflows. All right, now what does that mean? John chapter 10, verse 10. Y'all know this verse. I came that they may have life and have it what? Abundantly, or some translations say to the full. Okay? I think to the full is not accurate. Because what's happening with the wine? It's not full. It does what? It overflows, you see. So I think abundantly more char characteristic, uh, um, categorizes that passage a little bit better. John 10, 10, I came today, may have life and have it abundantly. He didn't come, listen, he didn't come just to die so that you could be forgiven of your sins. Although that would be enough, wouldn't it? For us to be forgiven of our sins, amen. So that we may be living in, with God at, in eternity with him forever, that would be wonderful. But he did far more than that. He he not, doesn't just forgive you of your sins, but He gives you life to the point of abundance. In other words, your marriages don't have to be terrible. Your marriage doesn't have to be filled with tension and secret and unconfessed sin. It can be free and full and joyful before the Lord. He came that you may have life and have it what? Abundantly. Not barely squeaking by. And I know, listen, I know, Pastor Stewart, if you knew about the stuff that I was carrying around and not confessing, you would understand why I'm not confessing it. Listen to me. I know what I'm saying for you is that you can trust the Lord with this freedom. And He promises to provide not just what you need, but so that you may have life and have it to the full. Confess and be free. Your relationships don't have to be filled with drama and heartbreak. Your job doesn't have to be full of stress every single time that you walk through the doors. The Lord of hosts says that you can have more than that. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Maybe you just need to pray that prayer and understand that it overflows. Now, okay, pastor, I got it. It overflows. So what does that mean? Does that mean it's just for me to get drunk and fat on? No. Because what's the theme of this whole passage starting in verse 5? It's hospitality. It's generosity. He fills your cup to the point of overflowing. Why? Because it's for you to dole it out. Do you see? It's for you to be generous with it. It's not for you to get drunk and fat. 
Hospitality flows out from you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28 says, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So that he may have something to share. The, he goes from being the thief to a complete life change to now being generous, right? He goes from being solely a consumer and taking all of his life, but giving because the Lord has poured his blessing out upon him so that his cup does what? It overflows. What's the point of tithing? What does Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 say? We say it all the time. We tithe, we obey the Lord in this so that he will open the window of heaven and pour out a blessing until when? Until there's no more need. This is how the Lord works. But pastor, you're saying I need to give 10% of my money away so that I can be taken care of. You got it. You should have a PhD in this. Done. You got it. That's what the Bible says. Preacher, I'm worried your salary is already too big. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I'll show you my W-2s if you won't see them. <laughs> it's not big. <laughs> Listen, where is the table? All right, so we got it, right? He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He, he, he anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. Where's the table? Okay, go to the end of the psalm. Well, not the end, but where we just kind of left up today. It says, I will dwell in the what? House of the Lord forever. Where's the table at? It's in the house of the Lord, right? Now, a lot of this is lost in us because, you know, we, it's difficult for us to understand what a Lord is, which is why I did that introduction the way that we did it. Because a feudal Lord is an important category for us to have in our brain. It's the house of the Lord. Um, lords and landowners, back in the day, in the time of the feudal Lords in the Middle Ages, they were covenanted with their people. The good ones were. They were covenanted with their people to provide and protect for them, okay, protect their people if their people promised to pay tribute to the lords, okay? That's why they had castles and knights, because the knight's job was to be an experienced combatant and to be able to fight on behalf of the people if the time arose and it was needed. Do you understand all of that? It's kind of like a, sh it's like everybody had their own little military all put together during the time of the feudal lords. And if they were needed, that's what people were paying for because the Vikings were showing up and pillaging and things were crazy. Go read Alfred of the Great. Man, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. I don't have all the time to get into this right now, but that's okay. We are in the house of the Lord. He is preparing a table before us. The oil is on it. The cup is overflowing. But here's the interesting part. What were we with our Lord before we were in his house. What were we? Sinners. Man, God, we got like five-year-olds that know the gospel. Come on, baby. Let's go. Listen. We were sinners, right? Yes. Which means we were what? We were enemies of God. Not friends. And definitely not somebody that should be invited into the house. Do you see? Like we, we, were, we were against the Lord. We were our Lord's enemies. But instead of destroying us, what did he do? He pardoned us. But more than that, he adopted us so that we can be co-rulers with Christ. That's what the Bible says. That's why you will judge angels one day on the other side. That's why one day you have that authority because you are a co-heir, a co-ruler with Jesus Christ. Which is also why we're called Christians, another one of the reasons. Because we're, we took his name, right? He's our, our representative, and we are joint heirs of the entire estate, which is what? Which is the earth. And the new heavens and the new earth in which we, his people, will rule over. And we have a seat at his table with the oil and the wine of mercy and goodness. But there's more. Okay. You ready? We're about to go deep. So I need y'all to perk up a little bit and listen close. You have a seat at the table at the house of the Lord, which means a meal, provision, gladness, gladness, abundance, all of those things. But there's more than that. Luke chapter 22, listen close. Listen, listen. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you as my Father in heaven assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, we aren't exactly like the apostles, but here's the point. We have a similar commission. 
as the apostles did. And that commission is to do what? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, build the kingdom of God, go forth and proclaim the gospel, bring others into the faith. Oh, do all of those things. But how? Okay, now we're going deep. Where's the table? It's in the house of the Lord. But he prepares a table for me where? In the presence of my of my enemies. So I want you to picture this, okay? We, God's people, eat at his table in his house in the presence of who? Of his enemies. Of who you once were. Do you get it? Our orientation, our commission is the gospel to bring the message of Christ and his forgiveness into the world around us. And we are commissioned and sit at the table of Christ. And he prepares before us the bounty and the provision that we need in the presence of our enemies. Here's the mental picture that you should be carrying with you, okay? You sit at the table as Jesus fulfills it. He is donned and suiting up. Our Lord is suited up and doing battle. And so too are we. And the ground that we are fighting to gain in this world is right around us at the table. Now go back to what I said just a moment ago. Don't lose me. Hold on. You were once enemies of Christ, but now we sit at his table in the presence of what? Other enemies of Christ. Which means that his table is a weapon. Do you hear me? which means his table of hospitality to us as his people is a weapon that propels those around us to either follow Jesus or run. It's a weapon. To get the enemies of Christ as we once were to see the goodness and reconciliation of Jesus. That's the whole point. That's what this is for. We were once sinners, but because of Christ who died for us, we can celebrate this time together. We can remember that his blood was poured out for us. We can remember that his body was broken for us. And while we were still sinners, enemies of Christ, he died for us and paid the price so that we can be his, so that we can fight, so that we can have an inheritance, so that we can be his for all of our days. That's radical hospitality. That's radical generosity. And that's the weapon. That's what turns the world on its head. The only thing these people have in common is Jesus. Look around. We've got every economic and ethnic class possible represented in this room. We have people who are starting their lives completely over from scratch. We have top executives. We have everything between. And the one thing that brings us all together is that we sit at the same table. And that's the weapon. You want to win more people to Jesus? Let them see it. We win through His hospitality to us and our hospitality to the world. That's crazy looking whenever you picture it though, isn't it? Because what he's telling us is to celebrate the victory while the war is happening around us. Can you picture that? Are you picture So like there's the table and the Can you imagine like the the D-Day on Normandy Beach? And they're running off the boats and they're going up the shore. And then there's somebody like, hey, picnic time. And the artillery cannons are just firing down on the ground around them. They're like, no, we're having a party. Crack the champagne. That's ridiculous. But this is exactly what God's calling us to do. We feast and rejoice and we celebrate. Because our fight's already won. Jesus has already landed the deciding blow. It's finished. That's what he meant when he said that whenever he was hanging on the cross before it was done. He said, it is finished. The war is over. We're the mop-up squad. Do you get it? We're we're the mop-up squad. Do you know what I'm talking about with the mop-up squad? There's still pockets of the enemy throughout the world. 
That's okay, we got it because Jesus is on our side and the Holy Spirit courses in our veins. Now y'all party harder. <laughs> that's, that's it. We rejoice and we celebrate because the war is already won and that celebration is a weapon for us to wield in our victory. Jesus, is the fight's done. What kind of war looks like that? This one does. This one does. All right, last point, and then we're done. Look at verse 6. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So you get all the imagery. We see the table, the battle roaring around us. We're in the house of the Lord. He anoints our head with oil. Our cup is overflowing. Our generosity is a weapon to the world. It's how we win those around us. It's how the gospel is proclaimed. All of those things are true. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now this is a little uh, tricky. The house of the Lord, you know, is, is the place of worship for God's people. It's where the ark is established. Typically, you know, if you look in the Old Testament, um, that's generally the way it's established. Now, we operate in a different world now because we ascend into a heavenly throne room, right? That's why we raise our hands at the beginning of corporate worship. That's why we remind ourselves that we're ascending into the heavenly throne room. We're assembled with all the saints gathered from all over the world. It's a supernatural event. <sighs> that was a lot of review real fast. Okay, we got that. But there's a little hang up here. And it's with that word dwell. Now, if you've got the ESV or if you've got the KJV, it's going to say dwell. Um, or it might say something similar to the word remain right there. But if you, if you have a good one and you look in the margin or there's a little footnote next to that word dwell and you look down at the bottom or off to the side or maybe you click into it with your little app or whatever, there's another word there that's more accurate, that fits better the description of what's actually going on. What's that word? Do you all see it? It says Return. You see that? Return. If you look closely, what are we doing right now? We're returning. We're here. We're gathered in the house of the Lord. We're ascended in the heavenly throne room. We're worshiping with God's people. We've returned, in other words. What I'm trying to say is there is a table. We are in the house of the Lord. It is set before us. This is us. It's a description of what we're doing. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will return to the house of the Lord forever. This is us. We sit, we feast, we celebrate what the Lord has done, and then we stand up and we pick up our swords and we go out and we fight. That's the picture. We return. And we press the claims of Jesus into every single corner of the earth. And then we come back. And we worship, and we rest, and we feast, and our souls are washed, and we confess our sins, and we wield the table in confession like a weapon to build the kingdom of Christ, and then we pick our swords up, and we do what? And we go out and we fight again. And we come back, and I got some arrows poking out of my back. That's okay. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to sit down, I'm going to worship, and I'm going to rest, and I'm going to feast, and I'm going to hear the word, and I'm going to confess my sins, and I'm going to remember who Jesus is and what he's done for me, and I'm going to be invigorated, and I'm going to pick up my sword, and I'm going to go back. And you do it again. And again, and again, and again. And this is how we press the claims of Christ into every corner and facet of the world. The table is a weapon. Confession is a weapon. Worship is a weapon. This is what the Lord calls us to do. And we follow it all of our days. So, you tired? You got beat up a little bit this week? Got a few arrows poking out of your back? Got a few sword strikes that kind of clipped the helmet, maybe a little too close this time. Maybe you feel beaten up and worn down. Welcome to the hospitality of Jesus Christ. Welcome. He put this out for you. His table is set before you in the presence of his enemies. <laughs> and we are reconciled by his grace. His body broken for us. His blood poured out for me and you. Do you get it? It's us. So come in and sit down and put your feet up and rest on the goodness of Jesus. Let his head anoint you. Let his, let his hand anoint your head with oil. Sit back 
and watch your cup overflow. Confess your sins. Lay your burdens at His feet and feast with your King. And then turn. Pick your sword up and bring His Word into every corner of the world that you possibly can. Starting with yourself. Let's pray. Our Father and King, we thank You. We thank You that You are the great hospitable one. That You show us the profound meaning of hospitality. That You teach us through what You've done for us already. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And we remember that we were once enemies of Christ. You pay for our sins through blood. And we remember our sins. And we confess them. And You remember them no more. Lord Jesus, Your hospitality towards us is amazing. And we thank You for it. Our Lord and King, may we serve You with our whole life. May we repent and believe and honor You with all of our days. And may we hear Your Gospel proclaimed and hold fast to it. That if we confess our sins, You are faithful and just. And you will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May we confess with joy and be restored. In Jesus' name, amen.